Good faith is a hot topic in the common law of contract, a lot more so since 2013 when Mr. Justice Leggett, now Lord Leggett, who sends his apologies, um, in the Yam Singh case, suggested that a good faith, uh, a good faith duty could be implied into so-called relational contracts. Now, good faith is in the zeitgeist. Singapore's COVID-19 temporary measures uh, act grants contractual relief in specified circumstances. COVID-19 has led the UK Cabinet Office to issue guidance on responsible and fair contractual behavior. In relation to Brexit, the um, EU-UK withdrawal agreement imposes an obligation of good faith on both sides, although ahem, ahem, uh, the UK is behaving very badly at the moment. So what is this elusive concept of good faith? What has it got to do with contract law? I wanted to get to the bottom of it. I was hearing people go on about it and I wanted to work out how to think about it, get some sort of mind map, put down some recognizable points of reference, wrestle the grease pig to the ground. And here's the start that I've made. The orthodox position, of course, is stated by Lord Bingham that the common law recognizes no general duty of good faith and contract, relying instead on piecemeal solutions in response to demonstrated problems of unfairness. The question arises, next PowerPoint, please. Should we um, recognize a general principle of good faith? I think we should, and I'll explain why in the first part of my talk. Secondly, what difference would such a recognition make to contract law? And in the second part of my talk, I argue that the answer very much depends on the version of good faith that we choose. I support one of three possibilities that I call humble good faith. Thirdly, good faith is an elusive concept. That's not arguable. It's a bit of a black box. In the final part of my lecture, I identify um, features of good faith that illuminates its nature, its size, its shape. I propose that good faith comprises three attitudes that apply with different intensity via existing rules, depending on which of the four broad categories a contract belongs to. This is the three by four. So let's start. There are many objections to recognizing good faith, but I think none is irrefutable. I'll just mention five of these. Uh, next. First is, of course, the old chestnut that good faith would undermine freedom of contract and the individualist ethos of contract law. This is, of course, true, but freedom of contract has never meant anything goes. Many, many contract law and legislative rules restrict how we make contracts and what we can get from making them. For example, the need to limit freedom to preserve freedom is clear in the vitiating factors like misrepresentation and fraud. The common law can strike down agreed damages clauses that are too high or too low. Forfeiture clauses, restraint of trade and any exemptions of liability for fraud. Countless legislative restrictions are imposed on health and safety grounds, food safety, tenants' rights, unfair dismissal, licensing requirements. In fact, I have said to my students that the study of contract law is to a very significant extent the study of the limits to freedom of contract. In fact, limits to contract is so widespread, we don't even see it anymore. OK, limits are imposed either to avoid grossly unfair outcomes or paradoxically to preserve freedom itself. Now, these restrictions show that the traditional paradigm of relatively equal parties negotiating at arm's length is recognized to be outdated. The reality of modern contracting is marked by very significant inequalities of bargaining power, with the rise of multinational firms with very substantial market power, uh, with the ubiquity of standard form contracts that involve no bargain or negotiation or consent in any meaningful sense, 
And with the evolution of increasingly complex and interdependent transactions that require parties to cooperate in order to achieve the contractual purpose. So these developments bring into sharp relief the tension between contractual freedom and contractual fairness. It can never be a straight choice between freedom and fairness. Uh, we're, we are, um, you know, a lot of us are bound to sort of this binary um, idea that you can choose, but you can't. The law must strike a balance. It's a matter of degree and judgment and in the particular cultural, social and legal context. The second objection to recognizing good faith is to say, well, it's Parliament's job. It's not the court's job, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> Sorry, it skipped my mind, but, you know, the um, separation of powers, right. But the common law has always developed the law incrementally, and that is what the common law does. And anyway, parliamentary time will always prioritize things like terrorism, tax, pandemics, over something like the intricacies of contract doctrine. So my suggestion is that where Parliament has expressed the policy, courts should and sometimes they do follow. The third objection is the ubiquitous complaint about uncertainty, right? Certainty is important, but I think it's really overrated. It just can't be an end in itself. A rule that says, oh, we don't recognize the contracts of people with black hair would be relatively certain, but it would not be fair and it would not be useful. We're used to contracts applying quantitatively uncertain shape-shifting concepts like intention, consent, reasonableness, legitimate interest, proximity, fundamentality, foreseeability. These are indispensable in many areas of law without fatally destabilizing them. Even business people who supposedly care most about certainty sometimes see the need to agree contractual obligations to cooperate, to use reasonable endeavors or best endeavors, or even to act in good faith. The fourth objection is that a good faith principle is inconsistent with the common law's incrementalism. Now, the answer here is that, yes, some versions might indeed be incompatible with the common law approach, but others might not be. Take Lord Atkins' famous and well-accepted neighbor principle in negligence law. Now, note how it resonates with the good faith principle. Next. So it says you must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbor. Who then in law is your neighbor? The answer seems to be persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I'm directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called into questions. So note that the neighbor principle doesn't operate as a direct cause of action nor does it apply to all cases that can come under its description. Rather, what it has done is facilitate cautious incremental development from the existing categories. So an analogous approach to good faith would not be foreign to the modus operandi of the common law. The last objection is that recognizing good faith would reduce the exportability of English contract law. Now, English contract law is often the law of choice, even when neither party has any significant connection to the UK. And anecdotally, it's often suggested that the key reason lies in the absence of any express principle of good faith. But it shouldn't be determinative that the stronger party who can dictate the choice of law would prefer um, a law which is devoid of good faith obligations. Civil justice is not primarily a commodity that should be designed to appeal to its wealthiest customers. Instead, law is a public and social good, and it should reflect our society's ethical values. So I now turn to four positive reasons for recognizing good faith. Next. The first is the next PowerPoint, please. So the first is the powerful fact that we've already got it. In fact, if not a name. Minimally, 
if we think about it, good faith must mean a restraint on your self-interest and a due regard for the legitimate interests of the other party. Once we recognize this, it's evident that good faith has a widespread and profound, a profoundly important role in animating contract law. The piecemeal solutions in response uh, to demonstrated problems of unfairness operate at every stage of a contract's life, at every um, topic in contract law. We have, after all, been speaking prose all along without knowing it. We didn't call it good faith, but a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Secondly, uh, openly recognizing good faith makes explicit what is implicit, and that can only improve the transparency and coherence and therefore certainty of the law. Uh, thirdly, good faith is widely recognized in other jurisdictions, certainly in civil law jurisdictions like Germany, France, China, Japan, and also in international instruments and principles like the CISG, the UNIDROAT, uh, but also in some common law jurisdictions like the US, Australia, and Canada. So contract law in England and in Singapore are currently swimming against the tide. Most importantly, good faith protects the autonomy enhancing institution of contract. We naturally make deals, we cooperate and coordinate with our friends and family within the private law domain because we trust them and our relationship gives us leverage over them. The institution of contract facilitates cooperation and coordination outside the private domain by filling the gap in trust and sanctions, by resolving conflicts, by enforcing contracts. But in deploying the power of Leviathan, the law must set minimum standards for how the contract game should be played and what can be obtained from playing that game. Why? Because this upholds the integrity of the contract game and it protects those who play it from being abused. The parties can agree to change some of these rules, but other rules are mandatory and they can't be changed. They are constitutive of or irreducible minimum of what it means to make a contract. So let me give you some examples. You and I, when we enter into a contract, we can't agree that objective agreement is not necessary. We can't agree that fraud and duress will be allowed so that no rescission is available. That would be nonsense. Without such restrictions, the contract relation risks becoming the locus of exploitation or manipulation. Contract law, uh, by upholding that contract, would then risk colluding with such exploitation. And this would erode the institution of contract itself. Contract would become less useful, if not completely useless. The institution of contract would then be cannibalizing itself and ironically via the institution of contract. So adherence to certain minimum standards of contractual behavior, including good faith, must be a condition of playing the contract game and of engaging the support of the law. Now, it's also arguably something that parties would choose behind John Rawls' veil of ignorance. Pragmatic and self-interested parties are mere mortals who lack omniscience, who are driven by changing passions, who have limited processing capacity, and who can't plan for all possible contingencies. Such parties would agree that both parties should act in good faith. Restraining the freedom to engage in opportunistic or exploitative conduct makes contracting parties more secure and so more willing to play. Trickery and sharp practice will impede commerce by decrease, decreasing trust and increasing risk. Good faith and fair dealing promote commerce by supporting the central conception and basic foundation of commerce, a requisite degree of trust. Business people understand that. So what version of good faith should we adopt? Now, when I'm reading lots of articles on good faith, I realize that 
People who argue for or against it are often talking completely at cross purposes because they're supporting or they're objecting to quite different versions of good faith. And I think it is useful to disentangle three of these. The first, the most radical version is of good faith as an independent cause of action, a direct cause of action. This version is often assumed by good faith deniers when they compare it to a contagious disease of alien origin or to the proverbial bull in the china shop. Uh, next slide, thank you. And this bull in the china shop is marauding unrestrained through the carefully curated china shop of uh, contract law. The analogy would be if the neighbor principle and negligence were uh, translated into a legal requirement to take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which would foreseeably harm or injure your neighbor. Now, of course, it doesn't. That would be entirely foreign to the common law. It would be impossibly amorphous and unpredictable. It's the straw man set up for an easy knockdown by good faith opponents. Israeli contract law provides a cautionary tale. It's accepted that contracts there have been applied um, the good faith requirement directly to produce a fluid picture, which has totally changed the contractual map. It's produced very unclear rules that express an altruistic, moralistic view, and courts have refused to set any kind of boundaries. Now, this would be totally unsuitable for the common law. It poses an undue threat to contractual freedom and certainty. It contradicts common law's aversion to general principles and a preference for cautious incrementalism. Even the US Uniform Commercial Code, um, paragraph 1304, which imposes a mandatory duty of good faith in performance, explicitly states that it does not create a separate duty that can be independently breached. That's version one. Let's put it to the side. A less radical version of good faith casts it as an assertive, creative inspiration behind other obligations and defenses. Good faith on this model is like, next slide, the relentless Woody Woodpecker that aggressively pecks away and makes non-conforming parts of contract law align with good faith. The analogy with the neighbor principle would be if it operated to expand existing categories of negligence liability to bring it into line with the neighbor principle. It doesn't do that. The closest model is Article 242 of the German BGB which requires parties to perform their contractual obligations in good faith. Now, the courts in Germany have applied this to expand the scope of existing doctrines, like the duty of disclosure, and to create brand new doctrines, like um, pre-contractual liability and the doctrines of impracticability of purpose and change of contractual basis. This version of good faith can contribute uh, to a greater consistency in the law by exerting pressure on incompatible rules. And in doing so, the pace of legal change will be accelerated. Now, as the famous Gunter Tobner observes, continental lawyers have dealt with good faith in a way that is abstract, open-ended, principle orientated but at the same time, strongly systematized and dogmatized. This is completely at odds with the more rule-orientated, technical, concrete, but loosely systematized common law style of reasoning. The relentless woodpecker is still a step too far, a step too fast. It is a clear manifestation of an approach that would, um, sorry, pardon me, a clear manifestation, a manifestation of this approach would be the requirement of good faith implied in law. And this has been rejected uh, by law, by English law. Um, more fundamentally, more worryingly, if good faith is given such priority, it will shut out other policies or principles that the court currently weighs in the balance, like contractual freedom, like certainty, like avoidance of waste. So the relentless woodpecker would become a cuckoo in the nest of the common law of contract. We don't want it. In contrast, I present to you good faith as the humble measured tortoise 
next. Now, this does not aspire to any overtly creative role in contract law. It re merely reveals the nature of many existing and apparently disparate contract law rules as manifestations of the attitude of good faith. Rules like the limits imposed on the exercise of discretionary powers conferred by contract, as when banks can vary the interest rate on loans. Well, the law says they can't do so arbitrarily, capriciously, or wholly unreasonably. Or another example, the requirement of reasonable notice uh, to make onerous or uh, unusual terms in unsigned contracts binding. And we're told that the more onerous or unusual, the greater the notice, Lord Denning says the red hand rule, you know, lit up in great lights, if it's really unfair. Now, this version of good faith does not necessitate any immediate additions or changes to the party's obligations or defenses. There's no pressure for courts to actively change the law uh, it merely offers a restatement of the existing law by making its implicit ethical content explicit. So I support good faith as the humble measured tortoise. It's been adopted in common law jurisdictions of Canada and Australia. And Lord Hope noted that in mixed systems like Scotland and South African law, good faith is generally an underlying principle of an explanatory and legitimating rather than an active or creative nature. Um, by, create, by providing a framework for understanding the current piecemeal approach, this humble good faith can reduce rather than increase uncertainty. It demands no further limit on contractual freedom. And best of all, it's entirely consistent with common law's incremental approach and therefore should be entirely acceptable to the judiciary. Slow, and steady wins the race, chill. There's no revolution, but there will undoubtedly be evolution. One interpretation of Justice Leggett's judgment in Yam Singh is precisely that it just draws together a number of different threads running through the case law and derives a principle cautiously expressed, but capable in time of broader application via the familiar common law incrementalism. That is the genius of the common law. The difference between the relentless woodpecker and the measured tortoise is simply one of the degree in the pace of change. So what's in this black box carried by the measured tortoise of good faith? What's its nature, size and shape? I want to uh, uh, put forward six features. Um, first, uh, it's a, it's not a duty of good faith in the Hoffaldian sense of generating a right that yields liability for breach. That would be the charging bull. It's not that. Rather, I suggest that it's an attitude, it's a stance, it's a mindset that contract parties must assume in playing the contract game. Next. So this involves respect for the counterparty, right? The law has to say that if it's going to enforce a contract, you, you people have to treat each other with respect. And this is expressed as honesty and fair dealing. Then there must be respect for the contract that you've made expressed as fidelity to the contractual purpose. These good faith attitudes express a commitment to the particular normative and legal relation that is required and is assumed of those playing the contract game, irrespective of a party's actual attitude. These three good faith attitudes are manifest in existing doctrines and their application varies with the four types of contracts in question. I'll give you a rough sketch now and I'll fill it out a little bit more later. Next, so the four categories are, First, arm's length contract. We look after ourselves. Second, symbiotic contracts. The contract requires me to rely on you. Thirdly, contracts involving a recognized vulnerability. Either I put my trust and confidence in you because of our relationship or our bargaining power is markedly unequal. And then fourthly, the fiduciary relationship. You look after my interests. So broadly speaking, 
Next um, PowerPoint. So broadly speaking, class one arm's length contracts attract a base level of the three good faith attitudes manifested in existing top doctrines. And these are really quite substantial as we will see. This base level is then topped up with additional requirements calibrated to the nature of the contract. And we see an increasing intensity in the three good faith attitudes manifested in existing doctrines. So I'm gonna take um, each of these in turn very quickly. Taking the first class of contracts, the ideal arm's length contract is individually negotiated between commercial parties, discrete rather than long-term, and it provides for all eventualities. Now, of course, each of these is a matter of degree, but the closer a contract comes to the paradigmatic case, the less intense is the good faith attitude required. Examples are commercial sales and commercial banking contracts. The three attitudes of good faith are through and through existing contract law doctrines like the fat through Wagyu beef. And I can only mention a few of these. For example, honesty. We can see this in the law on fraud. Fair dealing. Uh, we can see it in vitiating factors like non-fraudulent misreps and duress. Um, third, respect for the contractual purpose. We can see it in uh, implied terms in law and in fact. We can see it in the frustration doctrine that will discharge a contract if the purpose becomes impossible to achieve due to change of circumstances. The second class of contracts, I call them symbiotic contracts, and they're characterized by the party's interdependence in achieving the contractual purpose. These are the ones that have attracted the relational contract label. But since all contracts establish relationships, the relational label really helps not at all. I prefer the terminology of symbiotic from my days um, studying biology because it comes closer to describing contracts that are interdependent in that the joint contractual purpose or the business model necessitates trust and confidence by one party in the other, if not by each of the other. These contracts are not zero sum games. Uh, the parties must cooperate to maximize the joint uh, profits. So things like franchise long-term distributorships. In symbiotic contracts, it's difficult or impossible to provide for all eventualities so that uh, in future adjustments might be necessary to adapt to ongoing changes in circumstances. All of these features then generate a justified expectation of loyalty, integrity, ongoing communications and cooperation from the trusted party. These are necessary to give the contract business efficacy. Hence the good faith attitude is intensified. The requirement of honesty might impose positive duties of disclosure and information sharing consistent with the purpose of the contract. The requirement of fair dealing might prevent a party from exploiting a contract for their own benefit in disregard of the other party's legitimate interests. And respect for the contractual purpose would prevent parties from obstructing the proper performance of the contract and require that both parties obtain the anticipated benefits from the contract. So just a few examples, you know, Yam Singh, the plaintiff invests a lot of resources, time, puts its reputation on the line um, and relies on the defendant to perform its part of the distributorship uh, arrangement for products to be sold at the plaintiff's airport duty-free shop. And in return, the plaintiff was entitled to the defendant's honesty, effective communication and cooperation. A term was also implied, uh, in fact, um, that the defendant would not prejudice the sales by offering the same products uh, in the same territory at a cheaper price, um, even though it wasn't duty free. All right. In another case, the party's collaboration required one party to give the other one access to its IT systems. Now, the court said, well, this imposes a, a duty on the latter not to access the IT system to obtain confidential information for its own purpose. In a third case, the court considered the conduct of one party in a joint venture 
as furtive or opportunistic, um, inconsistent with good faith when she entered negotiations to sell her interest to a third party covertly and without informing the other contract party. In the third class of contracts, one party is recognized in law as being particularly vulnerable to the other's advantage taking, although the advantage is taking is, is prima facie by lawful conduct. Her vulnerability might stem from her particular trusting relationship with the other, and we see that undue influence protects the trusting party. Um, the vulnerable party might belong to a class recognized as having inferior bargaining power. Um, in law, we see terms like consumers, tenants, employees, non-commercial guarantors, and various types of incapacitated or impaired persons. Here, good faith is intensified even further. The requirement of honesty might require specific disclosures to protect the vulnerable party's general interests, not just uh, interests um, linked to the contract's purpose, but her general interests. The requirement of fair dealing might require the stronger party to recommend and even insist or ensure that the vulnerable party gets independent advice. And the requirement of respect for the contractual purpose might guarantee the vulnerable party's actual reasonable expectations. For example, terms implied in law. And moreover, such terms may not be excludable. So these terms become mandatory. You get them for nothing. Here, have, have something for nothing. The fourth category of contracts I'm not going to say much about are fiduciary relationships. And here, the good faith attitude is the most intense of all. The law imposes stringent uh, duties to act solely for the beneficiary's interests. So we've covered two features of good faith. Next. So uh, the, we've covered the first two. So um, the good faith attitude uh, we go on to the third feature, which is that the good faith attitude is externally imposed by the law. This follows from the justification I've given you for good faith as necessary to protect the institution of contract and uh, on the nature of good faith as three attitudes that are constitutive of the contract game. Good faith is mandatory. It attaches whether the parties agree it to it or not. To enter a contract just is to do so with good faith. Now, on this conception of good faith, it's nonsense to talk about excluding good faith. Um, and I remember at a conference on good faith some years back, a practitioner, um, his contribution was to declare that when he got back to chambers, he was henceforth add a term excluding good faith duty in the contracts that he writes up. So when a party attempts to do that, what are we to make of it? And I suggest that it is at best evidence of the type of the party's contract, you know, which of the four categories, and therefore evidence of the intensity of the good faith attitude required. But it is evidence along with all the other evidence. It is not determinative. determinative. So now paradoxically, the good faith attitude, while mandatory and externally imposed, can also be intelligible as being internally assumed by the contract parties. Now, in fact, this is the dominant view of the case law and the literature in which good faith is seen as an implied in fact term. How do we square that circle? Well, an analogy can be drawn to the mandatory nature of the objective interpretation of a party's intention. So we impose the objective test and that is the, the, the correct interpretation, even if it deviates from the party's actual subjective intention. All right. But we still call it, we still call the objective intention voluntary. It is classed as your voluntary intention. So likewise, the good faith attitude is simply part of what it means to freely enter into a contract. To make a contract is just to voluntarily adopt the attitude of honesty, fair dealing, and fidelity to the contractual purpose objectively interpreted. The fourth feature of good faith is that it leaves ample scope for freedom of and self-interest. In general, good faith is an attitude towards whatever contractual exchange agreed by the parties whatever headline price or main subject matter, however uneven or unfairly balanced. 
that courts cannot make the exchange fairer or more even. Good faith does not require either party to give up a freely negotiated advantage, except that the parties are assumed to treat each other with good faith. The fifth um, feature is that good faith varies with the social and legal culture. And I'll give you some examples. Next, the Singapore Court of Appeal in upholding an express duty to negotiate a rent review in good faith said, we think that such negotiating good faith clauses are in the public interest as they promote the consensual disposition of any potential dispute. We know, for instance, that it is fairly common practice for Asian businesses to include similar clauses in their commercial contracts. We think that the friendly negotiations and conferring good faith clauses are consistent with our cultural values of promoting consensus wherever possible. Clearly, it is in the wider public interest in Singapore as well to promote such an approach towards resolving differences. In Korean Supreme Court, they found an actionable non-disclosure, clearly a feature of good faith, where the sellers of condominiums failed to disclose the existence of a nearby uh, waste disposal facility and another one of a cemetery. In Taiwan, a seller of property has to disclose if someone was killed or committed suicide on the property being sold because they don't like that. An unnatural death is very bad luck and the price will go down. In England, the judicial assumption that the commercial culture is based on arm's length dealing means that certain deliberate, self-interested, uncooperative behavior will not be regulated whereas it might be on the continent. So it's not that the required good faith attitude is different, but that the socio-legal interpretation of whether they apply to a fact situation may well differ. We have different attitudes. So the last um, uh, feature, um, next slide, please. Uh, so the last feature is that good faith is episodic and it's consistent with common law incrementalism. So not all acts or omissions that can be described as dishonesty, unfair dealing, or infidelity to the contractual purpose are sanctioned by the law. Likewise, the neighbor principle has not imposed negligence liability whenever carelessness results in foreseeable harm to one's neighbor, or um, whenever there's pure economic loss, or whenever there is psychiatric damage, or whenever there are um, duties of public authorities. As um, Oliver Wendell Holmes famously said, and to torture uh, undergraduates, obviously, that the life of the law has not been logic, it's been experience. The law's characteristic modus operandi, next slide, right, is the careful examination of the facts, the weighing of all relevant policies and principles, the selection and application of rules, the determination of uh, the correct standards, the fashioning of appropriate remedies, and going no further than is necessary to decide the particular case before them. So I make three concluding remarks. First, uh, good faith can be taxonomized in terms of three attitudes that apply with increasing intensity to four categories of contracts, from arm's length through symbiotic vulnerability contracts to fiduciary contracts. But we are not in the territory of bright lines, but of spectrums, of shades of gray, perhaps more than 50. It's not free of uncertainty, but then courts make good faith concrete by reference to existing rules and doctrines. Secondly, arguing for the recognition of good faith might seem radical, but I hope it's clear by now that by rejecting the charging bull and the relentless woodpecker and embracing the chilled out measured tortoise, my thesis is actually relatively conservative. It presses for no departure from orthodox case-by-case -case incrementalism of the common law. It turns out we have been practicing good faith all along. Lastly, evolution 
and not revolution has always been the name of the game in the common law. The pace of incremental development will depend on political, cultural, and even commercial considerations. Um, we currently have good faith light. Next. All right. If we want to go good faith half fat or good faith full fat, or even, uh, next slide, even good faith cream, double cream, extra thick uh, cream or clotted cream, that looks pretty yummy. There is plenty of inspiration from comparative law. The slow, humble, steady, chilled out measure tortoise can go far but it need not go far. And certainly it will not do so in a hurry. Thank you for your attention.